I don't know if you all managed to get through the exercise. Deliberately, it is difficult. <laughs> Did some of you uh, manage to get through it? Yeah? So the purpose of this exercise is actually to put, put in the compounds on the scale that we had before. So again, here we got the this, this scale from polar to apolar. And the, the point is that it's fairly easy, as, as soon as you know the principles, to put in the compounds in the extremes. So recognize the really polar compounds and to recognize the really apolar compounds. And all the things in the middle, they can actually be quite difficult to predict. And I talk to some of you and you say, oh, you, you can't see the difference. How on earth do you see the difference? You don't. And this is exactly why we got more than one separation principle, because sometimes it's not easy to predict. So if we can exploit a charge or a size instead, that might be, be more optimal. But, so, but, 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 but. The worst phase is usually these C18 chains. So they're sticking out from the particles and the interaction from your molecules to this is very, very fast. You know, they're moving out here and then, and the reverse phase is the fast foot principle here. This is why it's usually the most efficient. So this is where we can really see minute differences with molecules. So. Yeah, but we're not able to predict them. <laughs> not always. very well, not always. So did any of you have an idea when we're looking at pH 2 which of these compounds represent the most apolar one which is the further right end of the scale any ideas I know some of you got the answer what is your I would say A yeah and why is that because it has this big apolar charge yeah so it got this long aliphatic chain which fits like a hand in a glove with the C18 that Christian showed before. So even though it actually got this, this uh, sugar unit sitting on here, doesn't matter <laughs> compared to all these carbons sitting out here. And yeah? This is an amide, so no yeah. charge. So. Yeah, exactly. So this compound won't be affected by a charge either at low or high pH because Amides, they're not particularly good at accepting extra protons. So, and also this hydroxyl groups, it's sitting in beta position to the, to the double bond. So that will also hold on quite tightly to its proton. So it won't be affected at all. So this will actually represent the, the apolar end of the scale, both at high and low pH. If we try to look at the other end of the scale, if we take the low pH, which compound will be the most polar one, most soluble in water? Ideas? You have not you, I heard that you <laughs> got to give it a hmm? Yeah, fumonacin. And you also had the explanation you told me. <laughs> yeah, the, the four um, acid, acid groups. Yeah. So it got these four acid groups sitting out here. And they will contribute to the polarity of the compound. It's actually here. Yeah. So you got this beautiful <laughs> compound here. <laughs> Let's send it around. Compound. Yeah. So they will be charged at high pH. And here out in the end, we got uh, a, primi a primary amine, which will be charged at low pH. So this will have a charge both of pH 2 and pH 11, and this will be polar at all times. So this is the other end of the scale. But, but four negative charges, yeah. if you go high, means a lot more than one. Yeah. And the point is that even though you got that aliphatic part here in the middle, when you actually see the molecule, you can see that the, the, the TCA groups, the tricarboxylic acid chains sitting out here, they can fold in and cover that part of the molecule. So this was when I talked about 2D structures and 3D structures, this compound will fold up and be even more polar. So when we got the 3D structure. So this is the other end of the scale. And this is now we got the four remaining structure. And this is where it gets difficult. 
What, what do you think that happens if we then remove a hydroxy group here? Will it come, come out before or after in, when it interacts with this? Yeah. So, yeah. So when you remove, that's where you got the little table there. So you exchange an OH with an H then you'll see a positive contribution to your log B value, which means that it will probably elute later. Yeah. It will be more apolar. And that, that could be some of the things we will discuss to the exam. If we have a lot of isomeres you worked on, you, let's say one of the teams get this as the biosynthesis, then you should know that if you add hydroxy group, they will come early in reverse phase. If you remove some, they will come later. That's the kind of thing you will ask. We won't throw you six structures and say, now we want the order. And if we do, then, it, then you're up at the very high end of the grades. Uh, yeah. yeah, if you uh, can answer this one, you'll probably uh, pass right away. <laughs> yeah, so we got the four here in the middle. They're all what we'll call medium polar. Or, so here we got a pendabrumacudlin. I got five bromines. Bromines will contribute to a positive log D value. It will make the compound a lot more uh, apolar. So this is one of the, the next ones coming after this one up here. But in fact, at high pH, it got a phenyl group down here, which means that it can be negatively charged. It's a weak acid. So this will actually change polarity at high pH, it will become more polar. Then we got a compound here. It does not have any groups that can carry a charge. It won't be affected by changes in pH. So it will lie in the middle, more or less, no matter what you do. Where exactly in the middle is not the point of this exercise. Um, but it will be unaffected. Then we got this funny compound up here. And Christian will have a case for that later on, because sometimes polarity and solubility and retention is not always the same, and this goes for this compound here. But if you go look only at the polarity, the log D value, this phenyl up here, charged at high pH, and then it does some funny stuff. So even though it's an amide here, the double bond here, it can move around electrons and actually accept a proton. So this will be uh, positively charged at, at low pH. So even though it's actually a quite large molecule with a lot of aromatic systems, it's actually quite polar at, at low pH. And the last molecule here, you've got an enol, which has the same effect as a phenyl. It's a weak acid. The electrons here of the double bond, they, they will uh, be pull away the electrons of the, the bond between the O and the H. High pH we got a negative charge. And actually, the pKa of this one, in this extreme example, this is a true example, is the same as a carboxylic acid. Okay. So it's about 4.5 here. You wouldn't, normal chemists wouldn't believe that, but that is actually the case. Yeah. So a little bit of a difficult exercise, but hopefully you'll get a feeling of, of movements and, and relative polarity. And that would be much more. Yeah. So when we're talking about separations based on polarity, we got three separation principles or three types of chromatography you're going to learn about. We've got the reverse phase, normal phase, and helic, hydrophilic interaction chromatography. And they're good for different types of compounds. So we got the, the scale before. Reverse phase is a very versatile method. It's got a very high polarity range, so it, it can actually hold on to quite polar compounds and it's able to separate very apolar compounds as well. So this is a really good starting point. The order of how molecules move through the column, moving through the street of bars. You've got the polar ones, they will come out first because with the stationary phase that Christian showed here as well. C18, it's very apolar. That will attract likes, so it will attract apolar compounds, while the polar ones will be 
more quickly pushed through. So we'll have the polar compounds coming out first and then apolar coming out last. The stationary phase, what's sticking on the, the beats or the particles? C18, as we talked about already, but you can also have other types of, of, of functional uh, groups. If your molecule so what sticks too well, we could then of course get a C8 or a C4. Yeah. It's very easy for the chemist to make these. Yeah. So that changed the polarity of the stationary phase, and that of course changed the selectivity towards the polarity of the compounds coming through. The solvents that we use, the mobile phase, that we use to pull compounds away from the stationary phase is water, acetonitrile, and methyl, methanol. So these are the compounds, on the, uh, the solvents on the left side on the scale, the polar uh, solvents, most of course water, and then acetonitrile and methanol. And these solvents are really good, especially when we do, yeah, uh, detection with uh, mass spectrometry because these solvents do not affect the ionization of these compounds. But we'll come back to that later. Yeah. So when we have normal phase, as a reverse phase and normal phase, reverse phase is what we normally use, and normal phase is what we not normally use. So it's very confusing, but this is the original way of, of making chromatography. That's why it's called normal phase. And this is actually where you got your separation of your apolar compounds because your stationary phase is more polar. It's not uh, decorated with all these C18 chains. We got the pure silica. You got the bead when you got the R group sticking out. No R group, just silica. So it's really good for fats and sterols and triglycerides and, and all these apolar compounds. And the order of elution is the opposite. So it's the most apolar compounds, they will be pushed quickly through the column, while the polar ones will stick longer because the stationary phase is more polar. So again, we use silica, but we can also put just some hydroxyl groups on the silica, call that diol, or amino groups. So all these polar groups we can stick on the silica and attract Likewise, polar molecules. The solvents that we use for this are a little bit more harsh. So we use heptane, dichloromethane, ethyl acetate, uh, and methanol. So these are the apolar solvents. And this is a, one of the reasons why normal phase is not necessarily good for interfacing with MS because, yeah. We need some water, actually. Yeah. Water is good for making ions. So this is not something that you will usually connect with your MS or something like that. Another thing is that a lot of these solvents actually have great UV absorption, which again, like before the break, which means that we can't see the compounds that we want to detect by UV. So it gives a lot more background, but it can still be very good for separating compounds and then we have to use other types of detectors and Christian will talk about that later this afternoon. Then we got hydrophilic interaction chromatography and this is where we have the extremely polar to medium polar compounds. It's a more new method. If you've got normal phase, the old, old fashioned way, this is the modern modern way and this is the really modern way. So not a lot of people use Hillic and not a lot of people understand exactly how Hillic works. It's a one part chromatographic science and one part black magic. So um, yeah, but uh, still it's good to know that you got the possibility. You'll be the ones moving chromatography into a new era where we actually know how to use this method properly. Like normal phase, it's it got great affinity for the polar compounds. So the apolar ones will be pushed through the column much faster, and then the polar ones will stick. 
And the stationary faces actually resemble a lot the ones that we use in normal face. So it's silica, amino uh, faces, spitter ions, so uh, different faces that can carry both positive and a ne negative charge at the same time. But the huge difference compared to normal phase is the solvents that we use. So in normal phase, we got the very apolar solvents, heptane and all that we can't use for making ions. Oh, now this one's up. Um, while in hillic, we can use water. Water is actually the basis of hydrophilic interaction chromatography, which means that this is a type of aqueous normal phase that we can use when we want to detect by MS. So we use water, we've used acetonitrile, uh, and we use different kinds of buffers, salt solutions to, to as a mobile, mobile phase for this one. Oh, yeah? Meter? No, it's oh. just the laser not working. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Nothing? So you can actually modify your reverse phase stationary face to interact with more polar compounds. So again, because hillig is black magic, sometimes it's worth just looking at some of the more polar reverse face faces. So that can be a phenyl, a cyano, or a pentafluorophenyl, or graphite. So sticking on the beat, you can have all these different types of functional groups. And moving from left to right, they are more and more polar. But graphite is also voodoo, so yeah, that's <laughs> that can do a lot of strange things, and so that's... Uh... But it exists. It's always yeah, yeah. nice to know that yeah. it exists. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> depending on what type of functionality that you have on your stationary face, you change your selectivity. And uh, phenyl and pentafluorophenyl does not just, they're not just more polar, they also have other types of selectivities. And that is because of the benzene ring. So the benzene ring here, that can create these van der Waals forces that we talked about last time. You had a molecule, morphine, I think it was. So you got kind of a dipole here that will attract other aromatic molecules. So here you got the the uh, stationary face with an analyte aromatic ring sitting on top. So that will hold on to aromatic compounds even harder. Um, and also you have that dipole interaction in your pentafluorophenyl uh, group, which also gives you a different selectivity. So if you got aromatic compounds with similar polarity to so a, a non-aromatic, you can actually change that selectivity by choosing a different type of reverse phase column. Questions? When we're talking about the stationary phases in normal phase, again, we have the, the amino, the diol, silica, and different amide functionalities sticking on that. And it's very, very important that if you want to use one of these stationary phases for normal phase separation, you don't put water anywhere near that. Because once you do that, you ruin that effect. You only use these very apolar solvents. Because when you got the silica, all these different cross links that you saw in between, they can be broken by water, they can be hydrolyzed, and that will, will change the chemistry of the particle. So actually, when you work here, we also have some more, some small one-time use columns we can use to purify. And in those, you have to dry them in an oven. And you will also see working in the summer where it's very humid, it, they will not work as well as now where everything is dry. So, so also some that, that do, makes these, they actually add a little bit of water so they know that it's 0.05% water, something like that. But simply to say, we cannot control water, so we add a controlled amount. But in general, we try to keep these as water-free as possible. Yeah. So. But this is also why this chromatography is not as 
as, it's not as popular as the reverse phase because we have a reproducibility problem because of moisture and all kinds of things. Yeah. The difference, like I said, with normal phase and aqueous normal phase helic is that when you use silica or amino as a helic phase, you actually put water in there deliberately. Because here you see that silica surface here. And actually when you put water in, all that layer will be filled with water. And that water layer is actually your stationary face. Or you can say, can you say that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the water layer that is in here that is important and not necessarily the functional groups itself. So when you have uh, used hydrophilic interaction chromatography, here you got an, an amino phase and you got all that water bound in between the amino groups sticking out from the silica, which means that when your mobile phase has a high organic content, so when you start out with acetonitrile, for example, the polar compounds, they, they are not fond of acetonitrile. They'll go in and hide here in the water layer. So they'll stick to that water layer or the, the stationary face. And the mobile face with high organic will just pass through and let them rest there for a while. So when you want an hillock, you want your compounds to, to leave the bar. You want them to leave the column. You increase the water content because then the compounds can diffuse out from the water layer into the mobile face and leave the column. So here, this water layer is really essential for how that works. So we use water, we use acetonitrile. We don't use alcohols because when we put alcohols in here, that will confuse everything and make a very weird layer in between and we have no helic effect at all. So the water is the, the key part of the separation. So now we're going to start a poll. Hope that works. So here you got a TLC plate. So it's called thin layer chromatography. Have you heard about that before? Yeah, very quiet. <laughs> so here you got when like you got a column, you got a, a flow of mobile face passing through. So the compounds move in this direction. And then we got these acylated homoserine lactones. These are bacterial signal molecules. Bacteria, they make them to communicate with each other and send war signals and signals to colonize the surface. And there are a lot of different analogs of these. And they all have this homoserine lactone head. And then they got an aliphatic chain here of different length. So, in this case, you got a very long aliphatic chain, so you got a compound that is very apolar or polar. Apolar? Yeah, correct. So this is very apolar. This here, on the other hand, got a hydroxyl group, so it's polar. So apolar to polar, eluding with 60% methanol in water. What type of chromatography do we have here? So go vote and see how it works out. Can we click for band off? Yeah, I can do that.
stopping the poll? Anyone dares to tell me what they voted before I put on the distribution? No? Let's see if it works. Oh, that's beautiful. Almost 70% on reverse face. A few on normal face and hillock. But the correct answer is, in fact, reverse face. So you got the most apolar compounds coming out first, and then you move to the polar ones. Both normal face and hillock, they'll have the polar compounds coming out first. And also, if you were in doubt between normal face and hillock, you could see that on the solvents because we added water, which is a no-no in normal face. So this is... Uh, is the way that you can recognize these different kinds of chromatography. This is also a good, uh, for the ones who know what happened here, is that we added the compounds. And actually then you dry the TLC plate. And if you don't dry it, then it doesn't work, because then it will kill the bacteria after that. Anyway, then you have the TLC plate. And we then have a agar at 50 degrees. That's when it's almost starting to solidify. Solidify, yeah, and then you have a bacteria that can produce this blue color and then you put it in you shake it very fast and you pour it over the TLC plate and you wait for about four six oh yeah three four days and then here you can simply see then it gets colored where you have the signaling molecule this is also an example of where we interface you chromatography with biology and use biology as a detector yep yep We'll move directly to a new poll. Now I'll give you some hints on how you can recognize the different types. And I'm just going to start that. So here again, we want to know what type of chromatography it is. But we will also, um, as a secondary question, you can vote two times. So you can ignore the second part of the question if you want to. But which of these? Diacetyl glucose and glucose is peak number one and peak number two. So from the text up there, see if you can try to recognize the type of chromatography and then figure out whether or not the apolar or the polar analog of glucose will come out first. <clears throat> And if you don't see the, que uh, the question on your computer, try refreshing the browser. I don't know how quickly it updates. And again, you can just ignore the second part of the question if you... Any final votes? That was more difficult, maybe? Ah, last one coming in. <laughs> 
So, excellent. <laughs> so you all guessed more or less that this was Hillig. You definitely, none of you voted for reverse waste, which is great. You realize that you started with a high organic content. So, which means that it's either normal phase or hillic, but you got water, which means that it's hillic. And the order of these two, that is more difficult. So that's 50-50 on, uh, on the votes. And this is because we both have polarity of the compounds and polarity of the stationary phase, and now everything is confused. But hillic, we got the apolar compounds coming out first. And which of these two are the most apolar one? Come on. Front row. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, you got extra C groups. You got acetyl sitting instead of hydroxy, which makes it more apolar. So this one will be the one coming out first. And this one will be the one coming out last. And it would be the opposite if we had reverse phase. So now I, I understand why you're confused. So like we talked about that we can predict these log D values. And log D predictions, they're good for prediction of retention time for some compounds. So here you got these homoserine lactones that you got on the TLC plate before. It's a beautiful linear relationship between retention time and log D value. So you see the more, the longer the chain gets, the higher the log D value, the more apolar of the compound, the longer the compound will stick to a reverse phase column. So I, I recall here, this is actually calculated. This is not measured in a lab. This is just a calculated one, but also here, even though let's say it actually doesn't calculate it right or a little bit wrong, but then, you know, adding here still helps a lot. So, but, you know, it would only move it up. So that's why it makes such a good correlation. So, so these calculation tools are very, usually very good in one to predict a small modification. Yeah. So actually when you got a chromatogram like this, Again, you can predict the order of retention based on polarity. So now you got a lot of exercises um, in the, the printout. And I'm just going to go because I realized that the last exercise, this is the last exercise for this section. Um, so. There's coffee on the table, there's cake on the table, you can move to the next room. And we'll give you what, half an hour, Christian? Yeah. Yeah. Half an hour to talk about the exercises and then we'll... Uh, yep, coffee and sugar and everything should be next door.